Today we're going to talk about aging in place. And one of the first questions I'm going to ask you is, who wants to live in a nursing home? Raise your hand. Nobody. Well, consider that. So we're going to talk about how you can age in place. Thank you, Amber. Many of us want to stay home as long as possible, right? That's our goal, to be able to age in place and age really well. One of the problems that happens is that as we age, certain things happen and we're going to either have to make modifications or we're going to end up having to leave that home. So the goal here today is to talk to you all about how you can age safely at home. Home safe home. When, when you have a loved one that's been diagnosed with dementia, yes, the concerns of keeping them at home are going to be a real challenge. And we're going to talk about some, one, some of those. You also need to plan. If you have a loved one with dementia, you need to plan on how you can keep them safe for the longest amount of time at home. And we're going to talk about different sections. We're going to talk about environmental issues. We're going to talk about medications, uh, kitchen, bathroom, all of those things. And I'm going to be giving you guys a primer. And then uh, our next speaker is going to talk about fall prevention. Right now, we'll talk about safety and comfort measures at home. Because as it happens, if you can keep safely at home, you're going to reduce the risk of falling. And you're going to reduce the risk of accidents that happen at home. Modification should be done as early as possible because those of you who are caregivers with people with dementia know that change is very difficult for them. So if you're going to make modifications, make sure you do them early. This is my dad, by the way. He's aging successfully. He's 87 years old. Yeah, he looks good, doesn't he? Let's consider some tips for helping your loved one while staying safe and continue to live at home. Safety in the home, 101. There's lots of considerations. Now, the medical alert and buddy system are kind of the go-to. The problem with those is that I know my dad just got one. He did not want one. He kept saying, I'm okay, I can get to the phone. But now he has one. And the medical alert or buddy system ensures that the older person has access to someone at a button's push. It's really, really nice to know. I'm sure that there are several of you all who have loved ones with dementia who like to get out in the yard, like to shop, like to uh, go out in their shop, or like to garden. And if they're out there, it's just a bu button push away. Buddy system also. A lot of times in neighborhoods, if you age into your neighborhood, your neighbors know who you are. And so a lot of times, it's going to be the neighbors are going to be checking on you as well. And that's a really, really good system. One of the things that I talk to about uh, aging at home is developing what's called a help tree. Help. 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 Help tree. Help tree. OK. How many of you all have someone you can call at 2 o'clock in the morning? That's great. But if that is the go-to person every single time, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, they get tired. Yeah, change their number. <laughs> That's a really good one. The idea of a help tree, and you can do it in a neighborhood. I've, I've helped churches organize them. Is that you have that person who's that number one person. And if they can't do that or go to take care of what's going on or help, they have two people that they can call. Those two people, in turn, have two people that they can call. Those four people have two people each that they can call. You see, and it makes a tree. And the idea about the help tree, especially in the neighborhood, is that you don't have to be that one go-to person all the time. You rotate around. And so that way, the person gets full coverage. The neighborhood is happy to help because they know they're not going to be that one person every single time. So, someone, neighborhood, family member, caregiver that's responsible for checking on older persons. I have to back up and tell you all, I'm, I am a product of Arkansas. I've been here about two years. You too? Go Hogs. So, uh, in North Little Rock, Arkansas, um, they had a program with the fire department, and they called 
their homebound seniors every single day. They had a whole group with the fire department that called and did a well check with them every single day. And if there was a problem, they sent the firemen out because they're all EMTs. And it was a great program. It cost them. Cost to man that. So when you think about community funding and stuff like that, that might be also an idea for you. Fire extinguishers. Who has a fire extinguisher in their house? Smoke alarm. Do you get it checked every year? There's a few who said, no, not really. And here's the, the biggest thing I can tell you. Don't let an older person, especially one with cognitive impairment or dementia, smoke in bed. More people have set fire to houses doing that than, than not. It's a, it's a very dangerous thing. And if they are going to smoke, make sure someone's with them. Outside. Yeah, yep. Thanks, Amber. Home safety. Turn the hot water heater down. You don't think about that. Scalding and burning from hot water with people who aren't, you know, they'll turn the faucet on, they don't think about it, they stick their hand in there. So if you can turn your hot water heaters down to 120 <coughs> degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to avoid a lot of that. Mark hot and cold water faucets clearly. I know those of you who care for someone with uh, cognitive impairment have found that it's, it's really good to label things. I can tell you that I did. My, my mom died six years ago, vascular dementia, and I was one of her caregivers. Post emergency numbers by the phone or on the refrigerator. One of the good things about this is that EMT service, 911, if they know it's there, it's right there, it's all together. And cover unused outlets around there because sometimes people get curious or want to stick something in there and they may get shocked. But this one with the post-emergency numbers, it's a really good idea. You can get a Ziploc bag and a big magnet and stick everything in there and just leave it on the refrigerator. So anyone who comes in will have emergency numbers, medical history, any other information that they, they may need to know. Um, I know in Arkansas they have a do not resuscitate for ambulance service. And that's very important to have because if they, you, they get there and that person is in cardiac arrest and is a do not resuscitate, they need to know that. So that needs to be in that packet. Okay? Next. Kitchen precautions. Knives, toasters, grills. You need to keep in closed cabinets. Locks, if warranted. You know, I hate child drawer locks. I've done them, but they're hard for me to open as well as my mom used to, you know, try to bang the drawers open, but they, they are a good deterrent if you have sharp knives and utensils. Cover for the garbage disposal. These are really basic things that, that uh, you guys would think of. Remove controls on the stove. Cover the burners. Keep a lid on the trash can. Why do you think that's a good idea? That's right. You're absolutely right. They'll go wandering around in there. And also, some people uh, have a gadget that, that keeps the refrigerator closed because people with dementia don't necessarily understand what spoiled food is all about. And if they're hungry, they'll go in and pick up anything and eat it, and then you, you're dealing with someone who's really sick. Store hazardous items separate from food. Also, I could put on there uh, dog food, cat food, while it probably won't hurt them, it's just not a good idea for them to be eating it. Check expiration dates on food, especially if you don't live with that person, because uh, I, I had a client, I used to do house calls for the University of Arkansas, and I had a house calls lady who had eggs in there that were about 14 months old. Yeah. And you know, she didn't check them, and it, when I saw the date, I went, oh goodness. She would have been really sick, very sick. Use a kettle with an automatic shutoff. You know how to sign that? <laughs> a kettle. A kettle. <laughs> Next. Bathroom safety. Proper storage and use of razors, shavers, blow dryers, anything that, that could be really potentially harmful if someone gets confused when they're using them. Non-skid mats, shower on the floor, 
always monitor the water temperature. You know, remember we said 120 degrees, that's a very good idea. But if you fix a bath or a shower for someone, please test it before you put them in there or else it'll either be really too cold or you might scald them. If possible, only bathe or shower when help is available. There was a point in time where my mom uh, wouldn't get in the shower because she wasn't quite sure who my father was. And so I found the wildest looking shirt I could find at Walmart and I used to get in the shower with her. And so we sing and soap up. And it was great because it became a more enjoyable uh, activity for her than not. And my dad felt really bad, but he, she didn't want to take her clothes off in front of me. So you guys, it's a way of figuring out how you can do it and do it safely. Use non-glare 100 watt or greater light in all rooms, including the bathroom. Because as we age, I don't have my reader's on, but uh, your vision gets a little dimmed. Use safety rails, shower and bath, and Rhonda, wherever, wherever you are, we'll be talking about that later. Next. <laughs> She's hiding. Okay. Drug safety. This is a very important thing. And I know through experience, uh, doing house calls, uh, I had a lady, uh, as a social worker, I always go, when I do house assessments, I look in the refrigerator, and look in the medicine cabinet. And one particular uh, house I went to, the woman had a brown glass bottle with pen KV penicillin in it, 1969. So I was very interested in that. So I went out and I said, uh, are these yours? And she said, oh yes, you know I had that kidney thing? And I took a couple of those and I felt so much better. So I thought I'd keep them for when I had that kidney thing again. So, it's very, very, very important that, that you review the medications and uh, talk to the doctor or the pharmacist when they take a new medication for drug interaction. Read the medicine labels in good light to ensure you're taking the right medicine in the correct dose. There's all kinds of gadgets out there that uh, have an alarm for you and they push out your pills you're supposed to take and there's all kinds of balances and checks. But when it comes to medication, you cannot be too careful. You really can't. Check with your doctor or pharmacist before you mix alcohol with your medicines. Check your doctor before mixing over-the-counter drugs and prescription drugs. And have a good conversation with everybody in the house. I had a woman, I, I had a woman that came in with her husband. She was really, really sick. He had given her his Viagra. <laughs> Seriously. And so this is something you have to be very, very aware of. And you all know that older people don't want to spend money to share drugs, right? Here, this one, take this. This will make you feel better. This is what the doctor gave me. So you had to have that good conversation. But that poor woman was really sick. And then when we explained to her husband that Viagra was not a drug for women, he was a little embarrassed. And he said, well, it helped me. I thought it would help her. <laughs> so you had to do, yes, ma'am. One of eight kids, and my mother was living with mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. and She got sick and had to go in the hospital, and I went to stay with mother. I had no idea what she took when she took it. I mean, I know her name was on the bottle. Well, remember the refrigerator I was talking yeah. about? Yeah. That needs to include a list of the current medications and over the counter medications. And, but I guarantee you all, if you went into someone's house who, who was an older person with dementia and looked in their medicine cabinet, mm -hmm. I'm never surprised anymore, but I mean... One for my dad and one right. For my and if the spouse dies, you still have that medicine. So it's very important for you for safety reasons to make sure that those are disposed of. Because it's, it's easy to get confused if it's got the last name on it. They may not really be looking, and then so you, women are taking Viagra. So there you go. <laughs> go ahead. Visual aids in the home, night lights throughout the home. I tease my father because it looks like a runway down his hallway. But I know that if he gets up in the middle of the night, he's got light all the way through it. I like those. Have you seen the ones that you can stick anywhere and you just push it and it comes on? Those are really pretty cool, too. Cover the doorknobs 
And this becomes very, very important later on if someone progresses in their dementia because that doorknob, they may not know where they're going and you may not want them in there or out of the house. Use black or bright colored tape to identify the door or steps. Later on, they're going to have trouble differentiating and some of them are going to have depth perception problems. So if you do that, then, because you see people doing like this. And if you differentiate that, if a step goes up or a step goes down, that gives them a visual cue that there's something different about the floor. Wandering behaviors. This is, this is uh, probably uh, a large concern for people who have dementia that uh, are staying at home, wandering. And we want to keep them safe. Remember, we're talking about aging safely at home. You need to keep your windows and doors locked. A security beeper identification bracelet or necklace are always good. Never leave a person at home unattended. Now, I know things happen, but uh, I also used to do the work for adult protection services in the state of Arkansas, and this was the number one thing. I just went to the store. I just went to fill their prescription. I just went to put gas in my car. And when they got back, someone went there. <coughs> Yeah, you, you can take them with you. Next, please. Place, this is a really interesting thing, and I didn't believe it until I saw it. Mostly people, when they go to open the door, or it's right here. If you put a lock really high or really low, a person with dementia is not going to notice that, and they won't be able to get out. So that's a good thing to know. Always keep a recent picture of your loved one. So if you see my dad around, you'll know he's way out of town. So if you see him on the side of the road, pick him up and say, I know who you are. <laughs> Arrange furniture. This is another really good thing to do. If you see someone who's, and there are furniture walkers. You guys know what a furniture walker is? And a wall walker like that? It's very important to give them the space to wander around because if they can't, you may see some behaviors, some agitated behaviors because they're, they're very frustrated because they can't move freely around the house. That was it? All right. Any questions right quick? Well, we have to be quick, and then our next speaker's coming up. Any questions? I just make one comment. My, we've got a friend whose wife has Alzheimer's, and he put a picture of her on a business card, and there's a name and the address and phone number, and she went home and went home and went home because she likes to walk. There's two blocks she likes to walk, and he passed those out to all the neighbors. You have to be really careful about that because uh, I know that, that that can be exploited, especially if th that person is left at home by themselves some of the time, maybe in mild cognitive impairment stages. That's when the people come by and say, we will redo your roof or pay your driveway, but we need $500. And that happens quite a bit. In fact, uh, in abuse, neglect, and, and uh, exploitation, exploitation is the very first thing that instead of neglect. It used to be neglect, now it's exploitation. And I know in Arkansas, some of that, and that's a different lecture, but in Arkansas, there's a law out where bank uh, personnel can have a, a say whether or not they're going to give money to that person. If a person comes in and cashes a check every week for $50, and then one day this person comes in with an unidentified person and wants to cash a check for $5,000, used to the bank couldn't do anything about it. Now they can, they can stop and ask. So, yeah. Well, I think it's a law now in Arkansas, okay. and I'm not familiar with Tennessee, but yes, it's a good idea because e even though they're, they're aging safely at home, they need to be able to be safe wherever they are. So, I'll pass it over. Thank you very much. Did you have another question? There are some, uh, some that are, but they're very expensive. Mm -hmm. And most of the 75 watt ones they make now are just as bright as the 100. But it has something to do with that your eyes um, uh, don't focus as right. well in the right. bright, 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 even the, the ones that are, are um, um, the frosted kind of light uh, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, might be aware of that because uh, I, I 
I went looking for light bulbs for a hundred watts because it's hard for me to see even. Mm -hmm. And um, they told me that they just don't make that anymore. They don't need oh, more wow. to it at all. Well, so thank you. Is probably about yeah. the I laughed. I traveled with a great aunt one time and we stayed in a hotel and she brought her own light bulb because, I mean, she opened her purse and she got her light bulb out and, and because you can't, you know, we all know you can't see in a hotel room, but she carried her own light bulb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm Rhonda Broderick and I teach in the College of Nursing, so I'm very glad um, to see you all here today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is falls. Um, and, you know, I, I work with a lot of students who they want to do the baby stuff. And I think it's wonderful for them, but I like my patients full grown. And the older they are, the, the more fun I think they are to work with. So um, today we're going to talk about falls in terms of what contributes to falls, um, what the current recommendations are in terms of fall prevention, and some things that people can do to prevent falls. Okay. Um, and this is fairly simplistic to start with, but the definition of a fall, a fall is unintentionally coming to rest on the ground or other lower level in a way that is not the result of a major intrinsic event such as a heart attack or, or a stroke or something like that or as an overwhelming external hazard. So in other words, if you're hit by a vehicle or you fall on the ice, that's technically not what they would classify as a fall. Still has the same results though, doesn't it? Go ahead. All right. Why are falls important? There's an awful lot in the, the data about why falls are important in terms of injury and um, just the long-term consequences about falls. But I think the thing for me when I'm in the hospital and I'm, I'm working with patients, the thing that always breaks my heart is the first question or the, one of the questions I always ask my patients is, what concerns you most about being in the hospital? And, and almost always the first thing they say is, I want to go home. Um, because as we get older, we want to go home. And falls are one of the things that can really prevent um, our older patients from being able to go home and to be able to stay home. Okay. Okay, so results, there's no surprises here. Um, how many of y'all have fallen? <coughs> Everybody can raise their hand just about, okay, yeah. Um, it's not surprising. We have a lot of injuries. Um, we have a lot more healthcare utilization um, because of falls. We have loss of physical function. Once a patient fractures a hip, that hip, you know, even if they have the repair work done, it's not quite the same as that first hip. Um, loss of independence. You can also have mortality associated with falls. One of the things I find more interesting, though, is one of the things that happens when we fall is that we can become afraid of falling. And when that happens, it actually becomes a really negative circle for the patient because they fail they're more afraid of falling, therefore they scale back on their activities and it just, it, it turns into the circle where when you scale back on your activities, you don't have as much um, muscle function, as much tone, as much balance, and it just increases your risk of falling again. Why do they fall? There's not a simple reason. There's a whole lot going on in our bodies as we get older. Um, we're changing physically. Um, we don't hear as well. We don't see as well. Um, so in most cases, it's not one thing that causes us to fall, it's a whole combination of things. The stars just line up in the right position and oops, it happens. But there are two major categories that, that we're going to consider today. Okay. Um, individual risk factors, these are things we really can't change. Okay. So things like how old we are, what gender we are, females are at greater risk to fall. Okay. Impaired, um, the way we interpret, the way we judge things, that really doesn't change our functional impairments in terms of being arthritic, of having some numbness and tingling in our extremities. Those types of things we can't change. Go ahead. The other things, though, we can modify a little bit. So our environment in terms of what we're doing, um, in what's going on in our environment, our medications, alcohol consumption, and then there's our desire to age in our own homes. And you may wonder why I have Peter Pan on there. Um, a lot of older adults, they actually purchase their homes when they're much younger. They have young kids and all of that stuff. And the first thing on their mind is not whether a wheelchair or a walker is going to fit through that doorway, whether they're going to be able to get to their counters from a seated position. So we want to stay in those homes as we get older, but a lot of times functionally, it's just much harder to do that. 
So what, is, what are they recommending at this point? They're really recommending that we're more um, aggressive in number one, recognizing what, what the factors are out there and then looking at ways that we can individually work with patients to help them decrease their risk of falls. So what I really want to focus on um, today is what um, we can do. How many of y'all have been to the doctor and they're asking you that question, have you fallen in the last 12 months? Okay, that's a standard screening tool now. So when we go to the doctor, we should be asked, have you fallen? Okay, um, if the patient says yes, go ahead. Okay, if the patient responds yes to that question, then at minimum, there needs to be a gait and balance assessment. And that may sound really complex, but on the next slide, it shows you a very simple gait and balance test this that you can do. I'd like you to rise from that chair without using the use of your hands or arms, walk across the floor, and return to the chair. Okay, this is, the, um, gait, this is a very easy gait and balance test. It's one that could be done in office very easily. It's one that when we have nurses or physical therapists coming into the home, they can actually do this test very quickly. Then you don't score well on that test. And then we know if you can't do that, we know we've got mobility issues that we need to work with. Okay, patients who take less than 10 seconds are usually considered normal. Okay. So as that time period gets longer, it's an indication that we have more issues with mobility and we have a higher chance for falls. Okay, so then at that point, really what we need to do is we need to look at all the different factors. And this is something, to do it in a, in a group setting like this, we can talk generalities in terms of we need to know the history. If the client's fallen, what are they doing when they fall? Is there something, you know, is, is it every time the patient, sta the person stands up and starts to walk, boom, they fall. Um, so what are the circumstances around the fall? What is it physically what's going on with our patient? Do they have arthritis? Um, do they have diabetes, which in turn has caused some numbness and tingling in their low extremities? Functional assessment. We can actually, we can, there are things that we can do with patients in terms of functionally, what can you do? In terms of bathing, um, toileting. Is it an issue with standing up and sitting down on the toilet seat and being able to stand up easily? And then environmental assessment, coming into the home and looking around to say, okay, these are the situations that we have. With my students, I'm always asking them, I'm saying, well, you know, you're sending your patient home and their post hip fracture, you know, do they have stairs at their house? How are we gonna get them? How are they gonna get up those stairs? What if their um, bathroom, the only bathroom in the house is on the second floor and they have to go up seven or eight steps to get there? Those are things that we need to be thinking about. Okay, um, so assessment and identification, it is individualized. When we go into the home environment, and um, Bitsy had talked a lot about several of these things, but throw rugs are a no-no, okay? Um, it's interesting, even if they're non-skid on the back, I watch this with my parents, Sometimes I just don't pick their feet up high enough. My mom tripped going out of the kitchen into the sunroom the other day, and I looked at her and grinned, and I said, "Yeah, I saw that door frame jump up and up, you know, jump up." But it's a she goes through there ten times every day, but she just didn't get her feet high enough that time. Extension cords and other hazards. Um, you know, we have a lot of wiring with our technology now um, in terms of computer wires and um, all of telephone wires. If you if you still have wired telephones, so. Um, you want to make sure that if there are wire, wires and cords around that you um, look at a way to conceal those or to anchor them down. Handrails on your stairs. Um, my mom swears one of the best decisions she ever made when we, she moved into our house when my brother and I were very small was she had handrails put on both sides of the stairwell. She said, I never regretted it. Um, safety equipment, especially in the bathroom. You may need to look at lowering the light switches. Um, you know, or finding some sort of adaptive device where the person doesn't have to stretch if they're, if they're working from a wheelchair type situation where they can actually reach um, light switches and um, that type of stuff. Interestingly enough, moving furniture is not recommended. They actually find that when you start rearranging and moving a lot of the furniture with older adults, it actually increases their risk of falls because they know that pattern. Um, most of us, I'm blind as a bat, you all, so if I don't have my glasses on at night, I can still get from my room to the bathroom 
because I know where everything is. So if somebody starts moving that on me, um, yeah, I'll probably trip over it or fall over it. In the bathrooms, um, if your patient has um, arthritis issues, um, you can use, you can use um, shower chairs where they don't have to get down in the tub and worry about being able to get out of the bathtub. There are elevated commode chairs that can be purchased so that they don't have to squat as far down to be able to sit on those toilet seats. Grab bars in the shower are important. Um, if they start to fall, they need to have something sturdy that they can grab. Most patients, you know, and most people, you know, think, well, I don't want those ugly looking grab bars in my bathroom, but, you know, I would rather have ugly looking, or, you know, grab bars in my bathroom than to be dealing with one of my parents, um, you know, in the hospital with a hip fracture. Okay, what else can we do? Go ahead, okay. Um, as the person, the speaker this morning talked about vitamin D, there is actually research out there that is showing that it is um, great for um, muscle strength and neuromuscular functioning. He was correct. Um, at least 800 international units per day. All right, so they are recommending calcium. Um, how many of y'all are milk drinkers? Okay, love my milk. Um, but, you know, the more calcium, the more vitamin D. All right, go ahead. Medication modification, general rule is the fewer medicines that we can get by with, the better off we're going to be, okay? Um, be very careful about over-the-counter medications. Um, even though they are sold over-the-counter, over they can interact with what you are being prescribed to take. Herbal medications is another area. Um, even if it's over-the-counter with my parents, I don't, we don't, and I'm a nurse, we don't start that medication until I check with, you know, we go to the doctor and check to make sure that it's not going to interact with anything else that we're doing at the time. There are some medications, Benadryl being one, there's a actually a list of medications that are not good for older adults. They do not work well in older adults. So trying to avoid those medications as much as possible, okay? Um, okay. Visual acuity, um, I've never had visual acuity in my whole life. Um, it's not getting any better as I get older. I have learned from experience. I have progressed into the progressive lenses. So, you know, I don't look down. I have to be very careful. With older adults, sometimes it's easier for them to take their glasses off if they're going up and down stairs because when they look down and they have that progressive part in that lens, it actually throws the depth perception off and it's much more difficult to navigate stairs and stuff like that. Cataract surgery um, is, is great. I mean, um, as soon as you have mature cataracts that are ready to be operated on, then go ahead and have those um, taken care of. It makes a world of difference in um, your ability to see, even in terms of color and, and clarity and that type of stuff. Okay. Postural hypotension is a big fancy word, um, but basically what that is talking about is if you're on um, several blood pressure medications, um, a lot of times as we go from that seated position and we stand up, does anybody get the wobbles? It's like, woo! Um, the more blood pressure medicines you're on, but when we change position, when we are laying down at bed at night and we sit up on the side of the bed to get up, and then when we make that transition to stand, as we get older, our, our body doesn't respond as quickly in, in leveling that blood pressure out. So it's like I tell my parents, make sure you're standing up before you start to walk, okay? So I want them to stand up and just stand there for a couple minutes rather than hurrying to start take those first steps because if the balance is off, um, you know, transition slowly. That way it gives your body longer to adjust. You do want to regularly look at your blood pressure medications. One thing that you can do um, with postural hypotension is you can increase your fluid intake. You have to be careful there. I know a lot of older adults are limited in the amount of fluids that they can do, but our older adults tend to dehydrate more quickly. Okay, so drinking uh, water and um, the non-alcoholic beverages is a good thing as you're older. You want to make sure you keep your hydration levels up. Okay, foot problems. Um, having been a nurse almost 30 years, and I know there's some other nurses in here, um, foot problems are just amazing. When you spend a lot of time on your feet, uh, over time, they just, um, they show the wear and tear. We do want to inspect feet regularly to make sure um, if there are foot issues going on. If you're diabetic, that is even more important because one of the things that happens with diabetes is you lose that sensation. Um, in your lower extremities, especially feet and legs. And so you need to actually visually look. 
there are diabetic patients that can have open sores on their feet and have no idea that they're down there. Okay, so if you're diabetic, take a hand mirror and bring your foot up and look at your foot. Okay, um, the new style shoes, I always love them. They crack me up because I watch the young girls walking in them and I'm thinking, dang. Um, <laughs> but I'm just telling you folks, I wear flat um, shoes, I wear non-skid shoes. Make sure your footwear is safe, okay? Non-skid bottoms, if you're going around in tennis shoes all the time and you're not falling, that's good, okay? If we're going around in this high heel stuff and our feet hurt and we're falling and tripping and we're off balance, that's not good, okay? Um, I save them, the one I think is the most important for last. Um, exercise, um, and I think a lot of times I am not athletic and I am not an exerciser, but in the last year, actually last year and a half, two years, I have um, started going to the gym, huh. which is probably a miracle that anybody that would know me um, would say. But a lot of times when we think of exercise, we're thinking about what we did in elementary school and gym in terms of having to run the races and all that kind of stuff. And that's really not what we're talking about here. We're talking about staying active. It can be just basic things like walking, um, you know, it's social. Um, older adults, when you see them in the gym exercising or when you see them in a class, they're having loads of fun. Um, so it's not necessarily the intensity, but the, the important thing is to stay active. Whatever it is you like to do, if you like to swim, if you like to walk, um, f figure, it out, figure out what it is and set aside time to do that, okay? Go ahead. There's a lot of uh, evidence out there that's showing that yoga and Tai Chi and some of those types of things, they're much lower intensity, um, and the older adults enjoy them and they get a lot of benefit from them. I can't do, and I don't know many people that can do what that lady is doing up there in that top picture. Um, it's amazing when you see older adults, and there are older adults out there that can do that. But they have classes now in the senior centers and in most of the, um, the gyms in, in the Tri-Cities region where you can do what they call the silver sneakers, okay? And these are exercise classes where if you're able to stand, it's great. But if you're confined, like to um, a wheelchair or to some sort of mobility device, you can also do exercises from that seated position. Then we don't have to worry about the balance and the falling and all of that, okay? Just as to, I'm gonna close with this little video clip, okay? Go back slowly, smoothly, to the right side of your waist. I think I feel happier. It just gives a, sort of a glow feeling over you when you get through with these classes. I would like to go horseback riding, my daughter said no. <laughs> when we first started, uh, it was more difficult, but it, we know we're, we're catching on. <laughs> it has helped me immensely with the stress factor to the point where it has uh, helped lower my blood pressure. I used to stagger a lot, and since I've been doing Tai Chi, I feel more secure. I practice every day, two or three times. Tai Chi can be successfully applied to older individuals because it gives them an awareness that they didn't think they had where they are in space. And I believe it blends an element of spirituality, mind, body interface that we still don't know how to describe. One, two, three, back, back. When I walked down the hall, I would always trail my hand on the wall. And now I walk in the center of the hall. I think it's wonderful. Oh, okay. I'll be 90 in October. That's what I heard about it. I came in right away. It really makes you feel good. I don't even think about my age. <laughs> okay. So you see, they're not doing um, intensive, hard, you know, breathing hard exercises. In a lot of cases, as you get older, 
it's just that you're active and you're keeping those joints fluid and, and doing that, some of that type of stuff. I did bring some booklets. There may not be enough to, but out here on the table. Um, and they have pictures in them of exercises you can do, um, you know, from a seated position with stuff that you would have at home. So it doesn't have to be fancy um, going out to the gym and buying all the fancy workout clothes and all that kind of stuff. It's stuff you can do at home with two cans of soup. Um, so um, big thing, guys, is just stay active, okay? All right. Bothering somebody. Yes, I do. And I really, um, having, my grandmother was 97, um, very active, very mentally alert, the, uh, you know, um, and she fell at home. And we had done all of this stuff in terms of we had a portable phone, but she would forget to put it in her, you know, pocket when she got it. And uh, she was just totally against a life alert type setup. And I, you know, so she did fall at home and she was, uh, she fell in the afternoon. It was a couple hours before my aunt got home from work and found her. Um, so, you know, I fight this battle with my parents. You know, the neurologist asked my dad, he, my dad has had issues with falling. Have you thought about a cane? And my dad grins at him and says, well, you know what they say, pride goeth before a fall, and I guess once I fall bad enough, I'll start using a cane. And I'm like, oh. you know, it's a, it's, it's a tough battle because you want, you know, from, from the daughter's perspective and the nurse, nurse's perspective, I want my parents to be active. So, you know, I don't want to be overprotective in that sense, but at the same time, um, yeah, somebody else had a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And then the vertigo feeling or the imbalance after the ADA. With the medication. So yeah. I think it's important that you just don't automatically think that because your doctor is recommending something that it's going to be actually good for you because everybody reacts differently to different mm -hmm. things. Yeah, you need to report any kind of side effects that you're having from any medication. Right. Right. Yeah. And don't assume that if you're having symptoms, don't assume it's just. That just happens when you get older. Um, I hear that a lot. I'm getting older, so I'm supposed to hurt. Or, you know, I'm getting older, so this is not abnormal. It's better, you know, go ahead and let your doctor know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my dad, that you saw the picture, he had a cane with him and at 87. It's just now that he has a cane. And he had back surgery two years ago. And he did the walker, and he says, I'm not doing this anymore. But the cane is because... I'm a gerontologist, and I have three other sisters who all work in the health field, and we just took him to the doctor and said, you tell him. So now he uses mm -hmm. his cane. But it is. It's hard because they, yes. don't, they don't want that. But also, stay active all you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you start using this and you're not active, you wish you could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, fair. it's much harder to get it back once it's gone. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Bristol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually everywhere because I checked before I came just to make sure I wasn't fibbing to you. Um, but yeah, I checked all the uh, Johnson City, Bristol, Kingsport, all have senior centers that offer the, the exercise classes. So, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. That's kind of a, that's, that's kind of a, uh, some people have problems, some people.
Pitbull Joan, I think it depends on if the dog's trained. You know, there are dogs that can stay out of the way. You know, those kind of things. So I would, I would think there's a lot of people that have pets, though, and that is worrisome. Yeah, yeah. very valuable. Right. They're valuable to the person's quality of life, but if you're at risk for falling, I would say have your pet trained or, or, or take it to a behavioral <laughs> pet co or whatever those kind of things are. Because we all have, we see people, mm -hmm. we know people that have assist dogs, so it's the same kind of thing. The other thing may be having an, an older established pet versus right. a new pet. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the puppy kitten may be hard mm -hmm. to deal with mm -hmm. um, if you choose a pet that's larger in size. So that it's, but a lot of times if the pet's been in the home with the person, they know that they're getting more unstable and they, will, they, they know to move. Yeah. Um, so it, sometimes it's adding the new part to it.